The behavior of the King of Prussia during the Silesian Wars shocked all of Europe. His grand scheme to make a quick strike in Silesia without provocation indeed came across as mad to the other rulers of Europe. But what struck people the most was his brazenness in breaking treaties, signing treaties, making peace, and ending peace. The French certainly were shocked by his brazen behavior. Both the Peace of Breslau and the Treaty of Dresden had been signed without the knowledge of the Bourbon court at Versailles. Once more for the Habsburg dynasty, regaining the territory of Silesia was crucial for, for the Habsburg dynasty to continue its uh, control over Germany. Austrian succession, they, they experienced a challenge to the Holy Roman Emperor position for the first time since the Thirty Years' War. The geopolitical state of affairs had changed significant, significantly since the rivalry between France and Austria began. Though both were Catholic powers, an intense rivalry was always at the heart of the Habsburg and Bourbon relationship. But this was not the same environment of the Thirty Years' War. The Empire of Great Britain had grown significantly, and it was now a power player in the Americas. The Habsburg Empire was now focused on maintaining its hold over the German-speaking lands. Geographically speaking, France now suited themselves as a better ally than Britain. The state chancellor, Wenzel Anton, the Prince of Kaunitz, began engaging the court of Versailles in 1754 to devise a plan to eventually solve the problem of the King of Prussia. For his part, Kaunitz had advocated for a radical change in Habsburg foreign policy since the end of the War of Austrian Succession. He had done well in convincing Maria Theresa and her husband Francis I. Kaunitz was given the position of ambassador to the court of Versailles in 1750. He spent three years in France, but uh, during this time he was unable to convince the French of the necessity to remove the Prussian king from power or to come to a general understanding. Though France had become dismayed in dealing with Frederick throughout the, seven, the Silesian Wars, they of, course saw the king, they of course saw the King of Prussia as an untrustworthy and were ally and weren't able to count on him when it mattered most. And to make matters worse, Louis XV and Frederick II were very different characters, and neither of which liked one another. Uh, Louis the Fifteenth was, of course, a, a pious Catholic, um, whose father uh, was Philip the Fifth's son. If you might remember from the uh, War of Spanish Succession, uh, he was Philip the Fifth's son, Louis. Uh, but Louis died in 1712. Um, his great grandfather was, of course, the great Louis the Fourteenth, who died in 1715. Louis the Fifteenth grew up as, as king, without a father figure in the shadow of his great-grandfather, Louis XIV. Cardinal Fury, or Fleury, or how do you pronounce it in French, uh, ran the court while Louis XV was an infant. And Louis XV, also unlike Frederick, was a uh, great womanizer who was known to have affairs with many women uh, in the court of Versailles. Louis XV, though he joined the war effort against Austria, he was nothing like the military visionary that Frederick had been had become. During his time as king, Louis XV struck up a relationship with a bourgeois woman named Madame de Pompadour. Now, in modern day terms, we think of the bourgeois as the ruling class, but of course in this time, and especially in France, uh, they were definitely the lower class, uh, the group of traders uh, and uh, merchants, not not the noble class that was the ruling uh, party at Versailles. And uh, during his the course of his relationship with Madame de Pompadour, 
uh, he eventually grew tired of her uh, sexually, but uh, she did become a very influential political ally and became a leading voice in uh, opening up negotiations with Austria. Madame de Pompadour favored the alliance with Austria and was very close to the Austrian countess. Uh, this certainly helped play uh, to the heart of the French king, Louis XV. Louis XV. But it was more so the rivalry with Britain and their competition for the land in the Americas, which ultimately convinced Louis XV of the possibility of a diplomatic change. As with all things, geography also played a major role in the decision. The Prussian king Frederick continued to cement his control over Silesia, uh, stressing the importance of the, of the role of Silesian linen. Uh, which was an important uh, material for the Prussians. Uh, and it's also worth noting the Prussian financial system was certainly more conventionally, or at least as we think of it, more conventionally uh, free market than the Habsburg uh, system of aristocratic uh, mercantilist control over the Silesian territory. Uh, this, of course, helped Silesia uh, grow at a much faster rate. Frederick did much to keep his cavalry and, infantry, cavalry and infantry in great shape, even in peacetime. He drilled his men daily and helped build the best cavalry in Europe. Many foreign observers, uh, even uh, mostly, mostly Voltaire, uh, noted uh, about the famous uh, strength of the Prussian military. But perhaps the, the biggest wild card in the entire situation in Europe was Russia. Russia, though not the most experienced or professional military, did have one thing that other countries did not, an incredibly large population. The court in St. Petersburg had been anything but stable in the years prior, though. And this was massively important to Frederick to keep a good relationship with Russia, whom he feared. Um, for if we remember, the death of Tsar Anne was the reason that Frederick had decided to invade Silesia in the first place. Um, but after the death of Tsar Anne, the infant Ivan VI was named the next Tsar of Russia. But shortly after, uh, a coup was carried out, a coup d'etat was carried out, which removed the infant from power and his supporters and placed the Tsar Elizabeth as a new Tsar in 1741. It's also worth noting the Tsar Ivan uh, the Sixth, the infant, uh, was placed under house arrest and sentenced to life in prison. Not many often uh, characterize his uh, treatment to that of uh, how Richard II killed the, uh, the kids in the, the Tower of London. But anyways, uh, during the time of turmoil in Russia, uh, the Swedes invaded uh, Russian territory in Finland in 1747. An alliance was later formed between Sweden and Prussia in 1747. In response, Russia allied itself with the Habsburgs. Frederick knew that the Romanov court that surrounded Tsar Elizabeth did not favor Fr Prussian influence and talked uh, very badly about Frederick. But before he signed an alliance with Sweden, he was able to make a marriage alliance with Christi uh, Christian Augustus, the Prince of, Al of Anhalt, uh, Zerbist, his daughter, uh, who was an influential, Christian, Aug uh, Christian August, was an influential noble in Prussia. He was able to marry his daughter, Sophia, to marry the next in line for the Russian uh, crown, uh, Peter III. Now, Sophia, the daughter of the ruler of Anhalt, once converting to Orthodox, to the Orthodox Russian faith, changed her name to Catherine. Um, of course, this would later be known as Catherine the Great, uh, the, the great Russian ruler who would take power after the war. But nevertheless, uh, this marriage pulled off by Frederick gave him a foothold in the Romanov court, uh, which, although right now didn't play to his advantage, would become very important much later in our story. But for now, the opinion of the Romanov court was very much against Frederick, and Countess began to capitalize on this but he still had the issue of Great Britain to deal with. One problem for British policymakers was the electorate of Hanover, which bordered Prussia. 
and they feared that their traditional enemy, Prussia, joined by France, uh, would make a quick strike at Hanover. But Frederick was in no mood for war and was open for negotiations with the British. The Prussians and the English made a deal in hopes to keep the peace in Germany, while the colonial war was still being raged, waged. The Convention of Westminster was signed in January 1756. Though in signing the agreement, Frederick had no intention of double-crossing his former ally France. The intentions of the Prussian king were to preserve peace. Uh, he was not aware of the Austrian countess' backroom dealings with France. Uh, Frederick did this uh, mostly out of fear of Russia, because Russia and Britain had recently uh, formed a military pact, though it was not official or officially signed yet. He was aware that they had uh, begun uh, dealings with one another. The Convention of Westminster was perfect news to Countess, for he had always been in favor of ditching Great Britain for what he considered the superior ally, France. In Versailles, they realized that the Prussians were untrustworthy. In the, conventions, the Convention of Westminster, which made Prussian neutrality a public policy. On May 1st, 1756, the hand was dealt. The French foreign minister, Anton Louis de Roulet, and the chief negotiator on the French side, Francois Joachim de Pierre de Burns, signed a set of treaties with the Austrian ambassador at the court of Versailles, Johann George Adam, Count of Stromberg. The agreement consisted of two treaties and seven separate articles, five of which were to be kept secret. The first treaty ensured the neutrality of Austria in France's war with Great Britain, which is about to be formally declared. The second treaty inaugurated a defensive alliance between the two con the great continental powers with the exclusion of participation in this upcoming war. The treaties which were signed at the Castle of Roulon, but became known under the name Versailles, marked what historians call the Diplomatic Revolution. The British had hoped to reach a military agreement with Russia, and this was at least part of the reason for securing his peace with Great Britain in hopes to dissuade the Russians from involving themselves in the affairs of Germany. Despite intense negotiations with the British, the Romanov court still carried a strong anti-Frederick sentiment. In March, the Tsarina Elizabeth asked the advice of Michael Vorontsov to present his opinion on Russian policy and the current state of affairs in, in Europe. His response, or his uh, research paper, of course inspired more debate than resolution. But the Tsarina took the side of Aronsov, which, which said that the Treaty of Westminster gave the Russians every reason to make an attack on the King of Prussia. On April 10th, the, the Tsarina made the foreign policy position to begin business to curtail the powers of the King of Prussia. Negotiations began with Austria in April, and as the news, the, or at least the formal news of the French and Austrian alliance became uh, uh, leaking to the court in St. Petersburg. Thus, when the Treaty of Versailles was signed, Russian began to mobilize for a general war against Prussia and Frederick, and would take necessary measures. And King Frederick would take necessary measures to do the same. Braddock's total defeat at the Mongolahela shocked everyone on the continent, including allies to the British war effort. 
for many of the native inhabitants of the Ohio country, it became clear that the French subjugation was ine inevitable, at least for the time being. It was also clear that English support could not be assured. Still, one last attempt was made to allow the Iroquois to f join the French, and uh, excuse me, join the English in the fight. From August 16th through the 22nd, the delegation met with Governor Morris and the Pennsylvania uh, Pennsylvania Council to ask for arms. Still, con still conforming to the protocols of Iroquois diplomacy, Sokra, the half king, spoke on their behalf. One word of yours will bring the Delawares to join you. Any message you have to send or answer, you will have to give them. I will deliver to them. William Shirley and his, ex and his forces continued to move north to begin his planned attack on Fort Niagara in Canada. He received the news of Braddock's defeat in August, as well as the personal unfortunate news that his son, who was serving as the secretary for Braddock, had been killed in the battle. General William Johnston struck up a feud with Shirley for diverting his troops from Crown Point, a feud which was to last the rest of the war. General Shirley received news that Admiral Basquan was unable, the naval commander Admiral Basquan was unable to prevent several fleets carrying six brigades of French reinforcements from reaching Canada. But Shirley's campaign would grind to a halt. He soon would realize that any further attempts to make an attack on Fort Niagara would be stalled for now. He would, have now, he would now have to make his headquarters at Fort Oswego, and for the remainder of 1755, that is where he would stay. The British would, however, make a successful attack on the French military post in Nova Scotia, which saw a great deal more success than any of the other British offensives in 1755. The British sought to Angli Anglicanize their Acadian subjects in order to prevent any possible rebellion in favor of the French. Most of the Acadians were, of course, French Catholics from the settlement along the Bay of Fundy and were caught in the British trap and shipped out to Britain and the mainland colonies, where their families were scattered among the colonial population. Perhaps 5,400 or more were herded abroad ships and sent off with what few possessions they could carry. Those who could escape, perhaps to 10,000, uh, fled to the mainland of Isla St. John, which is now Prince Edward Island, allied themselves with the Anbanax and Mimax, and fought back the best they could in hopes of regaining their homeland. Deportations against the, uh, and brutality against the Acadian Catholic population continued for the rest of 1755. William Johnston's campaign around the newly named Lake George uh, named after the king, of course, had been significantly delayed, with troops being diverted to assist Shirley. But Johnston, unlike Braddock, had sought to promote Native American assist uh, assistance to his campaign. Johnston even had married a Native American woman, and showed a great deal of kindness to Mohawk and other Iroquois peoples and their cultures. He was able to get the support of several hun uh, hundred Mohawk warriors led by Chief Hendricks, uh, who is pictured here. Um, he's, of course, a famous image you might see uh, associated with the uh, Seven Years' War, uh, famous for dressing in a British redcoat. At that point, however, Vaudreuil, who was the uh, new uh, governor of New France, began receiving urgent and exaggerated reports of Johnson's strength and movements, and decided that he would have to deliver Descu and about 3,000 of his men to defend Fort St. Frederick. Uh, Descu was the military commander um, in this uh, affair. By September 4th, he and 1,500 uh, men and about 200 regular grenadiers with 600, Canadi uh, 600 Canadian militiamen and 700 uh, Mohawks had advanced to the confluence of Lake George and Lake Champlain. A strategic spot called Caron by the French and Ticonderoga by the English. <laughs>
From there, they paddled quietly southward to the end of the South Bay and catched their canoes and struck off through the woods toward Fort Edward. About 9 o'clock on the morning of September 8th, the column with Chief Hendricks in the lead on horseback marched out to the camp toward General Desquieu and his 1,500 raiders. Desquieu was given information that the British were coming from a deserter who was captured on the road that morning. Canadians and Indians were sent out in ambush ahead of them, choosing a spot about four miles south of the lake where the road dipped to pass along the floor of the ravine. The Mohawks, once, uh, once realizing the force they were uh, to fight against, did not want to murder their kinsmen, and even tried to warn them. But, eventually, a shot rang out, and this ended uh, the attempts to... Uh, you know, not kill the other Mohawks. Uh, the shots began from Canadian troopers, which began the battle. William, jo William Johnson's troops held a force of about 30,000 men. The rival French force, which moved to cut off the troops, were around 15,000 men. The Mohawks on the French side, who had survived the first exchange of Scots, uh, shots, quickly began a measured retreat, fighting their way to the rear and perhaps a hundred of William's provincials. The rest of the column under John Johnson's provincials undertook a tactical retreat. When they were pursued by the French, the joint French, Canadian, and Mohawk forces pursued them back to the camp, where the main uh, British force was still at. The native troops aiding the French soon fell apart once the Kanawagas, uh, a Mohawk uh, tribe, had lost their leader. Now, they did not wish to make an attack on the entrenched camp, the defenders of which included hundreds of their Mohawk kinsmen. The Abenaki would not go forward without the Kanawagas, and neither would the Canadians, who in general regulated themselves by the conduct of the Indians when upon war parties with them. Desc Descu, uh, who was now in desperation mode, forced his grenadiers to make an attack on the British in hopes to shame the other troops into joining him. Uh, they did so with mild success, but Descu soon found himself outnumbered and outgunned by the British troops. With several hundred native and Canadian troops no longer participating, Descu sustained a crippling wound, but did however remain on the field, but the failure of the charge and the loss of Le Gardreau, the, uh, the Kanawagan leader, had doomed the attack. After four or five hours of increasingly uncoordinated firing, his men began to retreat without order. A group of French Allied troops tried to form a retreating party and camped overnight, but they were eventually pursued by around 200 men under William McGinnis, and their small French force was slaughtered there by McGinnis and his British troopers. It was the Battle of Lake George where the British won their first significant victory of the war. With the death of General Braddock, overall command in the Americas now passed to William Shirley. But, of course, with the Newcastle Fox Coalition, uh, newly formed in Parliament, with the death of Thomas Pelham, the first uh, uh, Newcastle, uh, they would never allow a colonial American officer to head this uh, you know, very important mission uh, and, and front in the war. Uh, Fox proposed the appointment of an Indian superintendent for the southern colonies, as well as the South Carolina trader Edmund Atkin. Finally, as Shirley's replacement, they proposed sending John Campbell 
the first Earl of Loudoun, an experienced military administrator. At Versailles, King Louis appointed the Marquis de Montcalm to head a French military command in America. The Marquis de Montcalm arrived in America in May 1756 with a large group of reinforcements set to make an impact in North America. General Montcalm was not the most experienced military commander in the French state. In 1741, though in 1741, Montcalm participated in the French assault on the walls of Prague. In the following year, he was wounded during the Austrian counterattack. Two years later, he became a colonel of the Auxur Regiment, and he fought in Italy until the end of the war. At age 31, he was badly wounded at Plaisance, taking five saber blows to the head and shoulders, where his regiment was wiped out and he was taken prisoner. He was uh, uh, released in a prison exchange, and he uh, tenuously rejoined the army to take part in the Battle of Ossets in the Italian Alps, where he received a bullet wound to the forehead. In 1752, the Marquis de Montcalm requested and received a pension from the king. He had an impressive service record, 31 years in the army, during which he had fought in 11 campaigns and been wounded five times. He retired to his Chateau de Conseil, where he was leading a uh, peaceful life and seeing to his children's education with the specter of a new war when the specter of a new war arose. In 1755, Montcalm had, taken up, had now taken up residence in the Grand Palace of Versailles in the court of Louis XV. Montcalm began jockeying for uh, a position in the military. Though reluct reluctantly, Montcalm accepted, accepted the position of the Marshal de Camp, or more easily understood as a position of a uh, general. He accepted this commission reluctantly. He did not desire it for himself, but the large salary that it would pay would secure his son's future. He was also promised a pension on his return, of which his wife would receive half if he were killed in the line of duty. When Montcalm arrived, he had very little understanding of, his, of the situation in, Amer in the Americas. Montcalm certainly did not see the value of using the native allies and thought their behavior as equivalent with savagery. He would do everything in his power to make warfare in the Americas more civilized and European in nature. In March, William Shirley, who had been stationed at Fort Oswego, was forced to abandon the fort and left a small group of troops to hold the fort under the command of James Mercer. They were left with minimal provisions and supplies, and they were almost forced to evacuate when the, f uh, the fort when they received a small amount of supplies uh, from a British uh, ship. This helped them uh, hold their position a hair longer, but then a few days later, on March 27th, the French and Indian raiders appeared as if from nowhere outside the palisade of Fort Bull. The raiders annihilated Fort Bull's small garrison, raised its buildings and palisades, and destroyed supplies and boats, and then quickly vanished back into the woods. This destroyed their supplies even more uh, than they had been before. The newly appointed Lord Loudon had surely replaced with Major General James Abercrombie, who arrived in Albany on June 25th. Loudon decided to send the new troops he was brought back from England to strengthen Oswego's depleted regiments and attack Fort Frontenac, and himself to attack Fort Frontenac. Not knowing his lordship's preferences, Abercrombie could not decide what to do with the regulars he now commanded in the Albany region. In all, there were about 3,000 of them, including four understrength regiment, several independent infantry companies, assorted artillerists, and a few engineers. Lacking any better ideas, Abercrombie deployed them as guards along the supply line between Albany and Fort Edward and waited for Loudon to arrive to, and solve his problem for him. 
The Marquis de Montcalm left Montreal on July 21st. His first objective was to remove the British from their defenses of the Great Lakes and uh, around modern-day Michigan. The force he led against Oswego included not only 13, uh, 1,300 highly trained French infantrymen and artillerists, but also about 15,000 troops and uh, militiamen under Regaud, uh, who's another general in the army, uh, and at least 250 Indians from about a half dozen uh, different uh, Canadian Indian nations. Montcalm intended to use the Canadians and Indians to force Oswego, to force the Oswego defenders out of the woods. But his regulars and gunners would conduct a siege in the European style, not in the Indian style they had fought previously. Montcalm first decided to make advance on Colonel Mercer's forces uh, held at Fort Ontario, which held around 1,350 uh, men to Montcalm's nearly 3,000 uh, 3, troops. Montcalm began the battle with artillery bombardment to the fort for nearly an hour. After a long period of bombardment, C uh, Colonel Mercer abandoned the fort, Ontario, uh, which the British troopers had occupied. The Colonel Officer uh, Mercer ordered the guns to be reversed on their platforms, even though this left his gunners without uh, uh, preparat to cover them and aim their cannon over the heads of the garrison. But Mercer gave the order to fire anyways. At some point in the battle, Colonel Mercer was hit in the head with cannon fire and was decapitated. The command soon passed to Colonel John Littlehills, who only after an hour longer of desperate attempts to defend the fort was forced to surrender General Montcalm. Given the fact of the poor defense of the British soldiers, Montcalm was not willing to give the British the ability to surrender with the traditional uh, European honors of war. The commander Little Hells would later say of the incident, Thus this place fell into the hands of the French, with great quantity of stores, which we suppose amount to about 9,000 barrels of provisions, a considerable number of brass and iron cannon and mortars. One vessel just launched, two slopes pierced for ten guns each, one schooner pierced for ten guns, and one row galley with swivels, and one small vessel on the stock about half built, a great number of whaleboats, and as near as I can judge, between fourteen and sixteen hundred prisoners. Now his numbers of course off, uh, but still, uh, including soldiers, sailors, carpenters, and other artificers. Montcalm himself proposed to protect, uh, protect the, uh, them from his Indian allies, but soon realized that he had promised too much. The native allies who accompanied the French forces were not paid like regular French officers. They mostly profited from the spoils of war, trophies, and goods. Uh, they were not given a regular salary. As the British officer Stephen Cross wrote of the event, the Indians had gotten into our fort. Old Oswego, they went searching for rum, which they found and began to drink, when they soon became like so many hellhounds after murdering and scalping all they could find on that side. Come over to the river to Fort Ontario, where Cross and most of his soldiers were being held up, with a design to do the same to all the rest, and on their coming near the fort, where we, where we was, and hearing confused noes of those within the walls, they united their hideous yells and rushed toward the French guards exceedingly hard to get in among us with their tomahawks, and it was with great difficulty the French could prevent them. The Indians killed between 30 and 100 uh, Anglo-American soldiers and civilians and made captives of an indeterminate number before Montcalm was able to restore his troops. General Montcalm was very embarrassed by the event and horrified that this type of uh, savage massacre, as he would refer to it, uh, occurred under his command. 
he omitted the massacre from his report given back to Versailles, only saying it would cost the king from eight to ten thousand livres, which will preserve to us the affection of the Indian nationals. Although he was displeased with the behavior of his native allies, Montcalm had scored a, uh, a first, his first victory in the, in the North American campaign and had captured Fort Oswego. The French, Austrian, and Russian alliance now assured, it seemed that war was inevitable, and King Frederick was not one to wait on his opponent. Frederick received word of Russian mobilization to their border, as well as the Habsburg army mobilizing into Bohemia and Moravia. Although the Russian attack was to be delayed, the King of Prussia was not one to wait on his opponent to strike first. He now understood what must be done. On August 13th, he ordered General Prince Fre Ferdinand of Brunswick to get ready to march on the 19th. Frederick and his troops crossed into the neutral state of Saxony, which would no doubt become a, battle a battleground between the Prussians and the Austrians. He wrote now to his new ally, Great Britain, that he would march into Saxony where he would meet little resistance, then subsequently march into Bohemia. He wrote of this plan, As winter approaches, we will have good quarters in Bohemia, which will disorder the finances of Vienna and perhaps render that court unre more unreasonable. As the Prussians made their march into Saxony, the Saxons uh, did not forcibly surrender as Frederick had hoped. Instead, the Saxon forces retreated south to a fortified uh, place on the River Elbe, at Perina. On September 9th, Frederick reached the Saxon capital of Dresden, where he stayed and waited as not to leave a Saxon force in his rear. The Habsburgs too began mobilizing on September 20th, under the command of Field Marshal Maximilian Ulysses von Braun, who moved to rescue the beleaguered Saxon force at Perina. The two forces came into contact with one another on September 30th, as the Habsburg moves from the town of Budden. Frederick approached the battle thinking he was facing a foe that was numerically inferior, when in fact it was just the opposite. He was the one who was outnumbered. The Prussian forces carried around 28,000 men, and the Austrian forces carrying around 34,000 men. The battle began on the morning of October 1st, 1756 with the Prussians moving first under the command of the Duke of Beveren. Frederick then sent General Caillou uh, to meet the Austrians in the valley. Caillou came up uh, with the village of Sol uh, with came up to the village of Solitz, where the Prussians were attacked in the flank by a force of Austrian dragoons. A heavy skirmish and shoot ensued, where the Prussian forces were supported by the Beirut dragoons. The regiments of the Austrian army soon joined in the fighting. The Austrian dragoons disengaged and withdrew, leaving the Prussian cavalry exposed to art artillery fire at close range from the Austrian uh, positions around Solitz. The Prussian cavalry streamed back the, uh, retreated back across the river in disorder to the positions held by their infantry. The remainder of the Prussian cavalry came through from the rear of the army and formed up with the remnants of Caillou, of Caillou squadrons, forming around uh, 10,000 mounted men. These regiments soon came under another uh, set of heavy artillery fire uh, from the Austrian gunners. Eventually, the Prussian cavalry 
acted without orders, uh, but galled beyond, en- uh, beyond endurance by the artillery fire, charged the Austrian lines, though the charge had no real focus, and came into grief along the Morellan, Bach, and against the sunken, ro- uh, the sunken road that led from Lubitz, uh, that led from Lubitz. At the hands of the Croat reg- irregulars who aligned the road, the Austrian army attacked the disordered remnants of the Prussian cavalry. The battle uh, soon turned into a series of skirmishes, uh, and it eventually just it turned into an exchange of artillery fire, which forced the Habsburg, who had uh, the Habsburg army, who had extended their supply lines too far, to make a temporary retreat under Field Marshal Ulysses von Braun. Uh, though this battle was technically a victory for the Prussians, the casualty rate was nearly identical for both of the fighting forces numbering around 3,000 for each side. Though this was not the decisive victory that Frederick had hoped for, uh, King Frederick would still claim victory, boasting to his sister, William Maine, and Field Marshal Swearin of the victory that, that he had just won at Lobositz. After the battle, Frederick then moved to attack the Saxon force in his rear, huddled at Perina. His troops besieged the city of Perina, on October 11th, and on October 14th, the beleaguered Saxon commander, holding around 8,000 men, surrendered to the Prussian army after days of artillery fire. The king of Prussia had hoped to make his winter headquarters in Prague, but instead, he would have to settle for the winter of 1756 for the Saxon capital of Dresden. <laughs> 